Istanbula Vinaka, everyone, and welcome um, to this Dev Policy Webinar, the third in the series for this year. The topic for today being worsening employment outcomes for Pacific technical graduate job seekers and one possible solution. I'm Sadhna Sen, the Dev Policy Regional Communications Advisor based in Suva, Fiji. This being a Dev Policy Australian National University Seminar, May we first acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands ANU stands and pay our respect to the elders past and present. Sisters, gentlemen, friends from across the Pacific, those from elsewhere who have joined us, thank you for your participation and interest and the warmest of welcomes to all attendees from the Dev Policy team. If you're joining us for the first time, the Development Policy Center at the Australian National University is an independent think tank on aid and development with a strong focus on PNG and the larger Pacific. I am your chair for this webinar. May I also introduce you to Archika Okazaki, our events coordinator and co-host for this webinar. And as a former journalist, may I extend a particularly warm welcome to um, journalists from across the Pacific who may have um, joined us here today. To our panelists now, and in order of presentation, they are Stephen House. Stephen is a professor of economics and director of the Development Policy Center. He's been working on PNG and the Pacific since 2005. Dr. Richard Curtin is a research fellow specializing in Pacific labor mobility um, and has been writing quite a bit on this topic, uh, which you would have seen in the Pacific media. Richard and Stephen together have written the discuss discussion paper, Worsening Employment Outcomes for the Pacific Technical Graduate Job Seekers, as well as the related policy brief, helping APTC trades graduates to migrate to Australia under the TSS or the Temporary Skill Short Shortage Visa. These two provide the basis for today's discussions. Just to explain the running order, Stephen and Richard will be sharing the presentation. Then we open chat and go live for questions from participants. This should give us ample time for Q&A and a bit of a discussion and maybe even a debate. May I now please welcome Professor Stephen House to introduce us to the findings of the APTC Dev Policy Discussion Seminar. Vinaka, it's over to you, Stephen. Well, thank you, Sadhna and Bula Vinaka, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us uh, today. Uh, this uh, has been a long time in the making, so we're very happy to be able to share this paper with you today. Uh, it wouldn't be a seminar without a PowerPoint, so let me just get that. Let me share the PowerPoint uh, with you. Right, yeah, so that's the uh, title, and in fact, Sardin has already told you the first part. This is actually, we're bringing together two pieces of work, related work that Richard and I have done uh, the discussion paper, which has the analysis and then a policy brief, which has a sort of policy response to that analysis. And, um, you know, please do go to our website and the publications page and you'll find those two under the discussion paper category in the policy brief category. Uh, so today's presentation, we're going to start out with the introduction uh, data and method then share with you our key results, then try and dig a bit deeper and explain the results. There are some interesting gender dimensions uh, to these findings, so we're going to highlight those, then wrap up the discussion paper part, and then add on the uh, policy brief, which is about this uh, TSS uh, visa and how it can help. So I'm going to hand over now to Richard, who's going to introduce the paper and explain to you the data and the method we use, and then I'm going to uh, take back and present the results. So over to you, Richard. Thank you, Stephen. Particularly glad to uh, welcome a number of uh, APTC uh, trainers and other staff who have joined the uh, webinar. I think uh, it's important to note that the 
APDC is now in its 14th year. And this is unusual for an aid program, which usually lasts between uh, five and 10 years. So it's clearly uh, being seen as a success. And that's been certainly the reputation of the APDC in the Pacific, where its graduates are highly thought of by employers and also uh, Pacific governments who see the APTC as having played a significant role in lifting the standards of technical trainers uh, in the Pacific more generally. That was certainly the feedback uh, I received when I was part of uh, independent review in 2014. And again, on the team that did the design for APTC stage three. We went around each of the Pacific countries and got that feedback. Now, the issue of uh, a key objective of the APTC was to uh, promote labour mobility overseas, particularly to Australia. And it's important to note that that objective hasn't been achieved. And this is a consistent finding that's come from the Graduate Tracer Survey results. Initially identified by Stephen House and Michael Clements and Colm Graham in a paper in uh, 2013, published in 2014, and it was confirmed by my analysis of um, this uh, same tracer survey data, with plus a more recent survey in the 2014 review, and the most recent tracer surveys also have confirmed this with the one in 2019 showing that only 3.5% of graduates had um, moved, migrated overseas for work. Our focus in the presentation is on the employment outcomes of graduates. And if we look at the next slide where we discuss the important distinction between uh, two different types of uh, graduate outcomes. We're looking at the issue of what happened to graduates who stayed with the same employer and those who graduates who did not. An important part of the analysis is to look at the employment outcomes of graduates by qualification. And that focus on qualification is, is an important element of what we've initially done with this analysis, because it, any, the APTC results that were produced in its the, the reports each year did not focus on outcomes by qualification. It's essential to realize that in understanding the graduate employment outcomes that the APTC was designed from the beginning as providing top-up training to reach the Australian standard and the Australian qualification. So this meant that graduates, uh, the students applying already had to have the competencies that they were being uh, trained to the Australian standard in. And this applied particularly to people coming to obtain a qualification in an Australian trade, uh, in an Australian trade. And that meant that they had to have a prior qualification, uh, a prior trade qualification with also at least five years uh, work experience, including that uh, time on the job that they would have had in doing their trade qualification. So APTC, courses themselves are only 22 weeks in uh, duration. So obviously that is not enough for somebody to acquire basic competencies. They can only be, uh, that qualification is only aimed at upgrading the existing competencies um, students have. The, if we look at slide seven, we can see here the information on the numbers of uh, respondents each year and the numbers of job seekers and job keepers. And in the final column, the 
proportion of job seekers. And that increases from 29% in 2019, reaching 46% in 2014, and then uh, a peak of 51% in 2017 and 2018. So we can see there over time, the proportion of graduates who are job seekers has reached uh, half of the total survey. Now, if we go to uh, the next uh, slide, this is looking at the response rates based on the APTC Graduate Tracer survey reports from 2012 to 2019. The overall response rate is 52%. Uh, which of course is lifted uh, significantly by the hard to explain high response rate in 2017. The response rates by country differ uh, significantly and that's noted in the paper. So this, this means that it's often difficult to look at the employment outcomes by qualifications for specific countries except in the case where the numbers are very large, which applies, for example, to Fiji. So the final point I think is uh, important to make that there is a bias in this information. If the grade tracer survey results are only recording information on half of the graduates, it's likely to over represent those graduates who are in paid work because they're easier to contact and are more likely to be want to be uh, part of a survey. And the survey results are likely to underrepresent those not in paid work. Uh, over to you, thanks, Stephen. All right, great, thanks, Richard. So yeah, so as Richard said, APTC has built up this great database over time by tracing, uh, by running these tracer surveys of graduates right from 2009. Now we just started our analysis in 2011 because if you look remember back the first table, the numbers are much smaller in the first two years. But from 2011 onwards, uh, you're looking at 500 students, uh, sometimes more than that per year. So that's the basis for our analysis. And the, the tracer surveys are normally fielded six to 12 months after graduation. So we're looking at the outcomes in that six to 12 month period. And as Richard said, the data is not perfect but it's certainly the best data we've got on employment outcomes. And there's no reason to think that the biases that are there have changed over time. So we're really focusing on the trends, uh, not the levels in this analysis. Uh, what we're presenting is very simple sort of tabular analysis. Uh, some, uh, a colleague, uh, Ryan Edwards and, and a student, uh, Tunia Chu have done more uh, complex regression analysis, which they'll be bringing out shortly, which really, which confirms these findings. So I think for the, these purposes, the tabular analysis is fine. So let's dive in. This is the results for all the graduates between 2011, 2019, and they're divided into these three categories. So the blue line is the ones who've, in that six to 12 month period, they found full-time employment. Uh, the red, you found part-time employment and the green ones are the ones not in paid work. And you can see there, there is a slight trend downwards uh, in that blue line. So the employment outcomes aren't as good, but they still are pretty respectable at around 79%. But you know, our sort of first fundamental point is that this is a misleading way of looking uh, at the situation, because as Richard said, this is made up of both job keepers and job seekers, right? And it's about 50-50 each. Now the job keepers are the ones who already have an employer before they joined APTC and that employer is guaranteeing their employment after APTC. So they're basically on leave. So obviously they're going to find a job when they graduate, right? And that's exactly what you do. If you look at those job keepers, they've all got a job, right? They're either mostly full-time, a few of them have got a part-time job and there's a minuscule amount not in paid work and actually they're volunteering. So they're at a voluntary job, right? But basically they, they're all at 100%. So we take them out of the analysis, right? Now I know some people are critical of that because it looks like, well, they're the successful ones. If you're taking them out, you're biasing the results, but if they're just not relevant for our purposes, right? Because we're not trying to do a comprehensive analysis of everything APTC does. We're not trying to assess the productivity gains uh, from these uh, 
students, uh, we're trying to find out what the demand is for APT, APTC graduates. So you can only assess the demand when you're looking at people who need to find a job, right? Uh, the, we use this analogy of, of a cancer drug. You know, if you use a cancer drug on people who don't have cancer, well, obviously that's gonna push up the success rates, right? That's just not relevant for the test. So what's relevant for our test are those roughly half students who need to go and find a job. And then we're gonna look at how successful are they. So from now on, we take out the job keepers from our analysis and we focus on the relevant group, which are those job seekers, right? The group that have to go out and find a job. So this is the data for the job seeker over that same period. And you can see uh, this trend downwards in the, uh, those with full-time work. You can see uh, a, the, the part-time work is fairly constant and you can see a pretty uh, sharp rise in those who don't have paid work uh, at the time of the GTS. Now there is a bit of volatility there. So just to uh, get rid of some of the noise, here we present three-year averages and you can see you're starting off at 77% in full-time work down to 61% uh, in the intermediate period, 2014 to 16, and then by 2017 to 19, it's only 55%. As I said, part-time work, there's hardly any change. So you're really seeing people switch into that no paid work category, which was nine, it is now 35. So, you know, those are pretty dramatic trends. Uh, and, you know, that's really the key sort of finding in terms of these worsening employment outcomes. You can break up the analysis, uh, as Richard said, by country and by course. And here we are by country. And you can see it's pretty much across the board that you have this worsening outcome, right? Whether it's uh, Fiji, Kiribati, PNG, Samoa, Solomon Islands, Tonga, Vanuatu. I don't think any of them buck that trend of worsening outcomes. Um, Actually, the next slide is in the wrong place. I'm just going to skip over that. I'll come back to that. Sorry. So yeah, it's pretty. It's a pretty simple paper, and that's the the main result. These worsening employment, uh, you know, very sharply worsening employment outcomes. So now we want to go on. I mean, how do we explain uh, those results uh, that we see? So there are different levels at which you can try to explain, uh, but the first level is just within the data. So what can the data tell us? Uh, about the explanation for this. And there are really two hypotheses uh, that we can test in the data. I mean, one possibility is that APT, because we know there have been changes in the sorts of degrees or qualifications that APTC has offered, and maybe APTC has shifted away from degrees in high, in high demand towards degrees in, or qualifications in the low demand. And so that's a sort of composition hypothesis. And the other one is falling demand, right? In fact, it's not, there haven't been big changes in composition. Uh, they're fairly minor. It's just that the same qualification is no longer in the same demand. Uh, so we can uh, test this uh, to some extent. Uh, we do know that there was a diversification in the second stage uh, away from the sort of traditional trades qualifications towards uh, newer qualifications, and we call those the stage two qualifications. APTC is now in its third stage, I think. But in its second stage, it introduced these new qualifications. It was things like individual support, community services, early childhood, youth work, disability, right? So different to the earlier phase, which was really, the first phase was focused on hospitality, uh, carpentry, uh, mechanical engineering, and so on. So those continued, the stage one, but the stage two were added. Right? And you can see that by the end of it, uh, about 20% of the students were in doing these stage two degrees. Right? So that's the first sort of hypothesis. And it's certainly true that these stage two qualifications have worse outcomes. I mean, you can actually see that every year, but I'm just giving you the summary result here. Right? Stage one, two thirds of them are in full-time jobs at the time of the GTS. This is only the job seekers. Uh, but stage one, two thirds, stage two, uh, less than a half, right? And big difference in the not paid work. So that shift from uh, stage one uh, to stage two is certainly part of the story. And, you know, you can ask why APTC shifted and, and we'll come back to that later. Uh, but there is another part is that even for those original stage one qualifications, 
uh, outcomes worsened. So here we're taking out the stage two, the new ones. We're only looking at those original qualifications, that three, same three year blocks of time to smooth out the noise. And you can see there is uh, a fairly sharp deterioration in employment outcomes. And in fact, this is the dominant factor, just because uh, the majority of students are still doing stage one. We've got 80% doing stage one. So it's the worst outcomes for the traditional qualifications that's the major factor. And then that shift to stage two is the, we regard that as the secondary explanatory factor. So those are explanations within the data. We can also, uh, you know, try and sort of speculate more broadly on, on what is driving this. Um, you know, that's fun to do and it's important, but it's, we don't have the data, so it is more speculative. I mean, there are three ways you can explain this data once you, once you step back outside of the data. One is that APDC, you know, keeps uh, pumping out these graduates. I think it's 15,000 in total. That's a lot of graduates into some very small and other small economies. And those economies just can't cope. I mean, that's a pretty um, plausible explanation. A second one is that the quality of the graduates has declined. Now, I doubt that the teaching quality has declined, but it could be the first people to enroll in APTC, they were like the best. Because you know, everyone wanted, everyone wanted to get an APTC degree, so APTC could choose and it chose the best. And now it's coming to the people uh, not as good. I mean, that's possible, but uh, of course, APTC is sort of the premier technical institute, so you'd think it could still get pretty good quality students. I mean, the third one is that it's just taking longer to find a job. So all these people out do find a job, it just takes longer. Remember, we're only looking at six to 12 months out. Uh, and it is likely that, you know, further on, people will find a job, although whether they'll find it in the field uh, is another question. I mean, number three, we just don't have any data for. So we sort of, uh, you know, I think we, we're not, we don't take number three uh, seriously. Number one and two, it's more difficult to tell Number one is certainly plausible, but you know, we, we don't have the hard data uh, to, to back it up. All right, so that's in terms of um, explanations. Uh, do feel free to send in uh, any questions uh, as I'm going. I'd be happy to take them. Otherwise, we'll do it, do it at the end. I just want to go on to the gender dimensions because there are some, as I mentioned, some interesting gender dimensions to these findings. Now we don't have, I'm sure A, B, D, Z, um, you know, collect data on gender every time they do the GDS, but somehow the versions we got only had gender for some years. We only had the gender data for some years. So the gender analysis is just based on those years. So this is a very complex table and it confuses me every time I look at it. So to help us work our way through, I've got a few circles. So if we start here, we can see that 42% uh, of A, B, D, Z graduates are female. So that's pretty, pretty good. And 41% are in pay, paid employment. And that looks like very good, right? Very equitable that the same, it's almost exactly the same share. But in fact, it's not, the situation's not like that at all. And this is a good example of why, you know, we need to take out the job keepers because here we're looking at all graduates, right? Job seekers and job keepers. If we just focus on the job seekers, which is the relevant cohort for this, can you find a job sort of inquiry? It's slightly lower, 38% uh, of the graduates are female, but only 33% of those in paid employment are female. So here we are combining the full-time and part-time. So there is quite a gender disparity, right? You've got 38% of the job seekers are female, but only 33%. Uh, the 38% of the graduates are female, but only 33% of the graduates in paid employment are female. So what is driving that gender disparity? And in fact, you can see there are two factors. So now we jump over to the other side of the table. First of all, you remember that stage one, stage two? So stage one, the traditional occupations like carpentry. Uh, females have a lower, uh, uh, lower success in, in finding employment in those traditional, uh, if they have one of those traditional qualifications, only 62% as against 75% of men. Now, why is that? Well, we don't really know. It might be, as Richard said, you know, you have to have some experience to come into APTC. Maybe the men came in with more experience and so found it easy to find a job afterwards. But for whatever reason, uh, you know, definitely the women struggled um, in, in this area. Um, 
perhaps there are you know views of import, discriminatory views of employers uh, in those traditional occupations. And then for stage two, we see well that's the same actually. So uh, females didn't struggle more in stage two. If they had a stage two qualification, one of the newer ones like a personal carer, uh, but they are both low. And here's the sort of the kicker a lot more females were in stage two, right? So it's almost half, right? 49% of females were in, got a stage two qualification versus only 12% of the men, right? You can see 88% of the men have stage one, but it, for, for women, it's 50-50. So stage two has got that lower uh, success rate and there are more, a greater share of the women with the stage two. So those two factors doing worse in stage one having more in stage two combined to push down the employment rate for women relative to their share in the graduation, uh, in the number of graduates. And this is the last uh, cells to look at. You can really see the difference here, 83%. Uh, uh, this is for all graduates, right? Not just the job seekers, 83% uh, of the graduates are in stage one uh, for men, but only 44 for women. So. Just to um, explain that uh, those findings in words, uh, female graduate job seekers have worse employment outcomes than male counterparts because they do worse in the traditional occupations and there are more of them in the non-traditional occupations and they have worse employment outcomes. And you know, if you look at the higher number of women doing stage two, it really looks like you know, one of the big reasons stage two was introduced was to push, was to improve gender parity, right? Because stage one was being dominated by men. So bring in some occupations uh, where women uh, are more likely to work and study. And, you know, you can be sympathetic to that, but at the same time, we should be looking at outcomes, that is jobs, not outputs, degrees, to judge gender parity success and more generally uh, to look at success. So I think this is an interesting case of where a sort of focus on an output uh, led to a neglect of actually looking, looking at the outcomes. And there should have been more questioning of why we're training women in these jobs where they're going to find in these areas where they're going to find it difficult uh, to find a job and also i think this is a good example of why not to keep include job keepers in this analysis right it's not that that 50 percent of the graduates is not important of course they're important right but for this test of employability uh if you look at um all of the graduates you completely miss these points and you you think gender parity there's no problem with gender parity so I think this, that, that it, it really illustrates uh, the, the utility of our methodology. All right, so just to, uh, to wrap up um, the, the main points, um, you know, I think uh, this is really, I mean, not to, not to boast, but I think this is a really important study. You don't get a lot of aid evaluations uh, done by academics and, um, this is a really big, uh, as Richard said, it's been going for uh, some 14 years and it's, it's taken hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, so it's a really important investment and ABC to his credit has produced this data over a long period that can be used uh, to do this assessment. So I think it's an important paper. It's not a comprehensive assessment, but it is an assessment of an important aspect of performance. Uh, which is about employability or uh, employer demand. I won't run through the specific conclusions again, but I will say, you know, one of the things that this paper's made us think a lot about is that whole narrative about brain drain, right? And, and we have to be really careful about people leaving the Pacific because it's going to exacerbate shortages. And you've got to think, well, if there are these shortages, uh, why aren't these people being snapped up? You know, that is sort of the puzzle that we're left with. I mean, we know skilled labor is being imported. So there must be shortages, but then why aren't they, why aren't AP, why are APTC graduates finding it increasingly difficult uh, to find a job? Uh, now to go to solutions, you know, of course you could think about many different ways to respond to this issue. One, you could rethink the qualifications that you're offering, you know, especially those stage two ones where we saw they're, they're very low. Uh, and just to quickly, because I missed, I had that, yeah, here's some individual qualifications. And you can see some of them, uh, it's only 30%, right? We'll find a job within six to 12 months, right? So 
you can definitely rethink your offerings. You could also publish some of this information so that the students know, like, should I be taking this course? What chance have I got of, uh, of finding a job? To do that, you know, we do think you need to increase the size of the GTS. And of course, it is difficult to push that response rate up. But I think it'd definitely be a very worthwhile investment. Investment. Of course, it'd be uh, very useful to track graduates further down the road. You know, we're looking at the six to 12 months through the GDS. What happens in two years or three years? That, that would be another very interesting project. And then the final solution is to promote labor mobility. Right? That was from the very start, APTC was intended to promote labor mobility. And of course, if most of them want to work overseas, if you ask them, uh, and that would definitely improve the employment problem. So that's where we go with our policy brief is to expand on that last uh, solution. But before I uh, go to that, I'll just see uh, if there are a few uh, questions. Uh, yeah, so let me just go. Uh, Dave Green's asking, was there any data on promotion of job keepers within existing employers? And what can we infer from that? Um, I'm not sure Richard would know what the data is on job keepers. Of course, the difficulty would be like, would they have been promoted anyway, right, without the APTC? So that's generally what you're going to there is like, can we measure the, the productivity improvement? And we know like employers are very happy with the APTC, students are very happy. At the same time, it is very he heavily subsidized. Normally people are happy with things that are sub services that are provided that are subsidized. So it is very tricky to measure those productivity uh, impacts, whereas this is a very easy test. Uh, to measure. Um, but is there anything, Richard, you, you want to say on that? Yeah, question? look, that question is asked in the Tracer survey results. Uh, look, it, it, there, there are obviously some get promoted, but it, it's interesting that there is a large proportion of graduates that don't get a wage increase or a promotion uh, out, out of um, their training. So that leads to an issue of to what extent uh, are employers recognizing those skills, get, placing a value on those skills. Great, and then we've got a question from Pradeep uh, Paria from Nepal. Let's thank you for joining us. And yeah, what are the main reasons and what suggestions do we have? So I think maybe we've just got to that now. Uh, the reasons relate to that composition effect and the falling demand effect. And, and we speculated some of the broader, the broader reasons and the solutions we've just presented. And Kelly Jane Pritchard's asked about dialogue with potential employers and race female graduates. Um, yeah, that's a really good suggestion. Um, I think that's yeah, especially in that uh, like it's not so much for stage two because they're the it's 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 equal, but definitely stage one you do see that worse uh, employment outcome for female graduates in, in stage one, and that definitely be worth unpacking as, as you suggest. Okay, so uh, we'll go on now to um, you know what we call the TSS solution. The TSS is a temporary skills shortage visa, and you know when we say the solution, we don't mean it's the only solution. But I guess this is the the, the solution we've been. Uh, we certainly think it's a useful one. It's one that we've been we proposed in this policy brief. Yeah. So what is the temporary skills shortage visa? It's you know it's for those of you familiar with Australia, you know, we used to call it the 457. Uh, now it's called the TSS. It's the most common pathway employers use to engage foreign skilled workers. And it's of interest because about half of ABC's graduates, so there's about 6,500, have a TSS qualification and work experience, right? You, 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 it's, it's got a restricted list of qualifications and you've also got to have work experience. And, but, you know, a large number have that, right? So it's a, it's a, there's a, it, ABC should be a natural pool for the TSS. But if we look back over the last five years, only 235 out of the 31,127 TSS visas have gone to the Pacific. Right? So the Pacific's almost totally missed out. So our very simple solution is to get more APTC graduates into the TSS. Now, why do we focus on the TSS rather than the PLS? If uh, you know the PLS, which is um, the Pacific Labor Scheme, you know, that's uh, a, a three-year visa which is focused just on the Pacific, right? And so you might think, well, look, that's a visa for the Pacific. Let's use that. And you know, ABTC has been focused on the on, on the PLS and has tried to, uh, for example, get some of the the aged care graduates into that. 
But, you know, we actually think the uh, ABTC graduates are better suited to the TSS. And that's for a few reasons. First, the big restriction on the PLS is you've got to work in regional areas, not in the big cities, but most of those skilled jobs are in the big cities, right? That's where the buildings are. That's where the restaurants are. Only 20% of TSS visas in the last five years have been in regional areas. Uh, second, you know, the um, PLS is mainly uh, proving attractive to employers as a low school visa, like by far the biggest group are meat workers, abattoir workers. So employers are not looking really, although they could hire schooled workers under PLS, they're not, right? So there's not a good fit actually between APTC on the one hand and the PLS on the other. And then the third reason, you know, the TSS is a low hassle visa. There are no pastoral care requirements. Um, you know, the, it's, it's, it's a matter between the, uh, the, you don't have to provide accommodation. You could bring your family, right? Which is a great thing. So we think there's also a lot of attractions to the TSS uh, from that point of view. Uh, why, why now? Uh, why is now the time for this? Uh, well, actually, because of COVID, you know, you might think like, why would you push labor mobility during COVID-19? But in fact, the Pacific is in a strong, that's a strong sort of argument for uh, COVID-19 uh, because, uh, sorry, it's a strong argument for Pacific labor mobility because the Pacific in general has done very well in keeping COVID-19 numbers down, right? So in terms of Australia looking for safe places to bring in migrants, it's gonna be looking to the Pacific. And of course, with the Pacific step up, you know, we want to link Australia in the Pacific recovery, and this would be a great way uh, to do it. Uh, why focus on APDC graduates? Uh, well, we, as we've already shown, most want to work overseas, like 90%, and it's both women and men. Uh, but very few APDC graduates have actually migrated. I think uh, uh, the number from the trace surveys is about 35 Percent. And as our analysis, earlier analysis showed, it is becoming increasingly difficult to find a job uh, at home. What about brain drain? Whenever you start talking about skilled migration, you know, people start talking about brain, brain drain. But, you know, we think that very analysis we've done shows it's getting more and more difficult to find a job. So then brain drain is not an issue. At the same time, a lot of the TSS occupations have four year limits, in which case you'd have to return anyway. But for those, there are some that do allow a longer stay or, or a permanent pathway. But we also think that's also terrific because we need to build up the Pacific diaspora uh, in Australia. We know the Pacific diaspora becomes a resource for the Pacific. Uh, then finally, you know, APTC is developing this idea of the away track and the assistance that it provides or that it could provide to students to access the TSS uh, could be directed to the non-sponsored students, right? To the, to the job seekers, not those who are actually still being paid for by their, by their employer. All right, so I think the last question is like, is, is why are those numbers so low, right? Why are there only a couple of hundred uh, Pacific graduates in, in the TSS in the last five years? And there are really two reasons. One, you know, although the TSS is a visa for foreign workers, two thirds of those are hired within Australia. So people come to Australia like on a backpacker visa or as uh, students, they find a temporary job and the employer can test them out. And if the employer likes them, then it's worthwhile for the employer to go through the hassle of applying for a TSS, right? So it's, it, it's really reducing the risk uh, for the employer. And of course, Pacific just doesn't have that access to Australia. There are no working holiday visas uh, at the moment for the Pacific, though I know one's been negotiated with PNG and others being talked about, but as far as I know, there are none actually now in operation. And there aren't that many Pacific students in Australia, so they miss out on these onshore hiring opportunities. And then the second reason is when employers do hire offshore, uh, they go to the big markets, right? Because that's safer, right? That, that's where you can find economies of scale. That's where the agents are. That's where the tests can be done. And so a very telling statistic is 35% of offshore hires are, from just, are just from the Philippines. So what could be done then? What is actually our proposal? There, there are two ways you could do it. One, make some policy changes. For example, you could give working holiday visas to the Pacific. You could subsidize study opportunities for the Pacific, uh, for Pacific students uh, in Australia. Uh, you could uh, facilitate placement opportunities in Australia. 
you know, so say ABCU students actually study in Australia, uh, not, not, sorry, not study in Australia, work in Australia, perhaps as part of uh, a qualification or perhaps after their qualification. Right? That will give the Pacific students uh, and, and graduates the opportunity to make those connections with the employer to prove themselves and then the employer will go off and apply for the visa and they can stay longer. So that's the policy change option. The second option is no policy change. And that would be, um, you know, not none of those changes, but still trying to facilitate those links. So for example, subsidize some employers to come to APTC, come and see the students, come and see the courses, come and see the high quality, and maybe sort of nudge them away from always going to the Philippines or, or Ireland uh, to do their, their hiring. There are also a lot of costs involved. You know, you've got to apply for the visa. You need to have some skills assessments, even if you've got the degree. Those costs could also be subsidized. You know, all this is the idea of kickstarting it, right? Once it's, once it's up and running, you know, the subsidies uh, could be reduced. But to kickstart the Pacific and APTC specifically as a place that employers go to for their TSS needs, uh, you need to put these subsidies in place. So which of these two options do we recommend? Of course, we'd like both. But the advantage is that the first one, you can start straight away, right? You don't need to have any cabinet decisions, legislation or regulatory change. This is just a matter of perhaps shifting some APTC resources away from processing students through degrees towards getting students uh, into, into overseas jobs. So that's our proposal, perhaps part of the solution to the problem we've identified. And that's the end of our presentation. So I just want to uh, thank you. Um, and, and by saying thank you, I want to thank various Groups. So I first want to thank my co-author Richard. Uh, I think the sort of our relative contributions to the presentation today uh, doesn't reflect our relative contributions to these two papers. In fact, it's probably the inverse. <laughs> so Richard really is the brains uh, behind this, and it's also his um, involvement uh, over the last decade or more that has enabled uh, us to do this analysis. Uh, of course, I want to thank uh, colleagues and and all the others uh, uh, who provided comments. On this, uh, on the paper, uh, I know not everyone agrees with us, but uh, comments and the interactions we've had have been really useful. And of course, I want to thank everyone uh, who's uh, come today to the seminar. Uh, looking forward to some discussion, uh, but do feel free to email us also with your comments. And if you are interested, uh, do have a look at the discussion paper uh, and the policy brief. So thank you, Sadna. Back to you. Thank you, Stephen and Richard, for your presentations. APTC is a substantial investment for livelihoods creation in the Pacific with that hope of serving the technical labor market needs of the Pacific and Australia. I'm sure stakeholders present today for this webinar have listened to the research findings and have much to ask. So um, we have some questions, um, some that uh, Stephen has answered, but please keep them um, coming. Uh, Richard, Stephen, I think there's a couple of questions on uh, the Q&A that still needs uh, to be answered. Please keep your questions and comments coming by clicking on the Q&A icon and sending in your contribution. Or if you want to ask a question, uh, raise your hand. And uh, if you're a journalist from the Pacific, please indicate in chat as well with uh, the name of your news outlet outlet and ask the question. Um, Richard, Stephen, over to you to answer the few questions that remain uh, to be um, asked and um, answered. Okay, well, maybe I'll ask Dan's uh, question and then Richard, you could ask okay. answer the one from Penelope. Um, but Dan's asking, I think you should all be able to see the question. Um, uh, Dan's asking uh, what's been the reaction of the paper from ABC and DFAT. I think ABC and DFAT uh, should speak to that rather than um, ourselves. So um, I would just, I mean, I, the, it was good ABC sort of um, broadcast, uh, interviewed me when we put the paper out and then interviewed ABC. Um, I would just say this is all pre-COVID. Um, so you don't see any impact of COVID in this. That was one point that came up in the debate. I think it's true, not everyone accepts this uh, job keeper, job seeker, and there's this idea we're being too harsh by focusing on the job seeker. But I just want to emphasize again that, you know, for our test, uh, you know, you have to look at the job seekers, right? It's like if you want to test a cancer drug, you've got to test it on people who have cancer. <laughs> it's, it's as simple as that. 
Uh, Richard, do you want to answer this question yeah, from look, Penelope? Well, just to go to Dan, and I worked with Dan on the APTC stage three. Uh, good to hear you taking part, Dan. Uh, I, th I think uh, one of the difficulties has been that um, the tradition in uh, the technical further education sector in Australia is not uh, to follow up on their graduates. And I, I think uh, APTC has been shaped by that tradition. Uh, I think um, there's also been a, a particular focus on the PLS and, and the way that was shaped around uh, uh, lower skilled occupations and APTC were asked to focus in on that. So I think uh, there is a significant opportunity for APTC to stand back and realize that uh, they can move in a new direction, particularly one that will have a significant impact on giving access to a number of uh, APTC graduates to longer term work in Australia. Now on, on Penelope's question, what can be done to contextualize localized training? Uh, it, it's important to realize that the, the training actually is according to Australian competency standards. Uh, that's, that's the value of it and, and that's the focus. I think uh, the important point because of that is to realize uh, to what extent does the domestic labor market want those skills. And as I said earlier, there is some evidence that a significant proportion of uh, employers actually don't pay a higher wage to graduates, which could be a good indication that they don't see the particular need for those skills or they're operating in a, in a labor market where they don't think there's a need to do that. So really the, the, the long-term uh, answer is for those graduates to be able to employ those skills, those competencies that they've shown in uh, an Australian context or into that with those employers that want that, that level of skill. Um, we've got another question um, um, from one of the participants. Uh, um, well, before we go to him, maybe if I could ask a question. If I if I um, uh, read read you or heard you correctly, uh, Stephen, who does the responsibility for? Uh, um, finding employers for this graduate, um, um, who holds the responsibility? Is it APTC or is it the Labor Mobility Facility? I mean, who's meant to find these jobs in Australia for the APTC graduates? Uh, well, the graduates are, I mean, the graduates are responsible themselves for finding a job. It's their, it's their responsibility, but obviously if, it's, if they're not finding jobs, then you've got to step back and say, well, are we offering the right qualifications and the right number? And are we targeting the right the right markets? So that's I think the that's the broader response um, once you look at this individual at, at the individual data. Yeah. Uh, Should we go to um, Anthony Bailey then? If, if they what is your hand? Yeah. Or just just to make a comment on that, it, it it's really going to be an inter, some intermediaries have got to play that role. It could be the PLF, um, and I think that there's a good uh, prospect of that. Uh, but there are others like uh, immigration agents that could introduce uh, employers to the APTC. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I thought you were asking Sardner about in, in domestic markets. But if you're yeah, if you're asking about in jobs overseas, yes, then clearly they're not able to find them on their own. So if we want to facilitate that, we do need to provide some assistance to link. Uh, to link uh, graduates with prospective Australian employers. And this responsibility is with APTC? No, well, not now, but if this um, proposal was taken up, then APTC could step up and do it, or the Pacific Labor Facility could also be another um, entity that could take on that, that sort of matchmaking role. 
Um, Ari, I, I see that Anthony Bailey has uh, raised his hand to uh, ask a question. Could we let him ask his question, please? Should be able to talk when he's ready. Anthony, over yep. to you. Sadhana, thanks very much. Um, thanks very much, Stephen uh, and, and Richard, and, and thanks also to APTC for uh, their contribution that you acknowledge in the report. Um, I guess uh, just a point and a question, there, there seems to be different approaches to analysing the graduate employment results with the data from the Graduate Tracer surveys. And so I'm wondering how can the different approaches be reconciled so that results and trends uh, accurately reflect the actual employment results? Right. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I mean, there are just two approaches. One is you look at everyone, Right. And you can certainly do that. Like, there's no harm doing that. But, but second, you know, you, this is kind of the innovation of the paper. This is a more informative statistic, right? Because if if every student um, was on leave from their employer, and then you said, "Wow, APT's got a hundred percent employment rate," it would be more like obviously, right? So that's uninformative. So I think that's the innovation of our papers to put this forward as a more informative metric of employment outcomes. Um, so, you know, I, people are willing to, you know, people, you can challenge us, but I've never seen, I haven't seen any analytical challenge. And it's, as I said, it's as simple as um, the, the idea that if you're going to test, the only test cancer drugs on people with cancer. Um, so I think that that is the methodological advance uh, of the paper. And, and we hope it will, it will stick and um, that, that uh, we can use this uh, going forward in, in future um, graduate tracer surveys. Uh, just to make a comment, Anthony, also it depends on what the purpose is that you're using the analysis for. If you want to, for example, if it move to a situation where uh, specific students are being asked to invest more in uh, paying for their course at APDC, then you need to provide more accurate information about what the employment outcomes will be for that qualification that they're looking at. So that's where you focus in on those who are not in continuing employment, but those who are out there as job seekers. So I might just um, take a couple more of the Q&A questions. So Elizabeth Jackson's asked about the Pacific Labor Facility. Um, so yeah, again, I just say, I mean, we've had some great engagement um, with DFAT, APTC, PLF and, and others, um, but it's obviously up for everyone to speak and, and if people are welcome to contribute uh, here today. And Sue Ellen O'Farrell's asked about, like if you went down this TSS path, uh, what about the welfare implications and what welfare support would be provided? And yeah, the real answer is it wouldn't, right? And the reason for that, is that um, you know you're treating them as uh, you know like like all the other fifty thousand uh, who get the TSS visas? Uh, I don't think uh, you'd want to have you know special additional restrictions uh, for the Pacific uh, on the grounds that they weren't they weren't able to. Um, I think yeah we we have that that's part of the SWP. Um, where people come for a short time. And then because it was part of the SWP, it's part of the PLS, um, but it wouldn't be part of the TSS. In, and I just want to emphasize, you know, the TSS is actually much better for the Pacific because you have the freedom to bring your family, right? You're not under that restriction like you are with the, it's fine with the SWP, but the PLS, you know, you could be away for three years uh, without your family. Uh, the TSS, you can bring your family, your, your spouse can look for a job, uh, your kids can benefit from Australian education. So I'd argue, even though it doesn't have those welfare provisions, uh, the TSS is actually a better, um, a better visa uh, for workers if they, if they can get it. Okay, we have a, just a slightly bit more time to um, ask a few more questions. I see a number of uh, APTC staff on our participants list feel free to um, jump in and uh, um, ask your question or, or, or any comments on what uh, Richard and Stephen have presented. Um, oh, Richard, why don't you answer Jonathan's question? Um, 
Jonathan. Thanks, Jonathan, for your question. Uh, look, to answer that, you, it would depend on what the actual trade qualification that you're talking about. Uh, you know, for example, uh, carpenters uh, may not have the uh, range of skills uh, because of the working conditions uh, compared to diesel fitters who would be working for uh, Caterpillar. So it, it would depend on looking at what the actual uh, work experience background was of individual uh, graduates uh, with trade qualifications to see whether they would uh, be able to uh, pass the TSS uh, assessment. Thank you. But we estimate about half, Richard, don't we? Have the yeah, yeah, uh, they will meet the requirements. Potentially have qualifications. And uh, work whether, experience. whether they then have have the relevant, uh, they'll have relevant work experience. But whether it's the sort of competency level that uh, um, Jonathan's talking about uh, will will depend on the actual work. Uh, who their employer was. Yeah, I might just add, we do have a section in the policy brief I didn't, I skipped over, which is about what occupations to target. I mean, I think if you want to take this idea forward, you would need to look like in more detail, talk with different employers uh, and narrow it down, uh, you know, as to where you're going to push forward in this area. So that, and that'd be one question to look at. Okay. We've got two more there, one from uh, Matt and uh, one from Elizabeth Jackson. All right, well, Richard, do you want to answer Matt Dornan's question? Yep, okay. Um, there is a big difference between uh, stage one and stage two, uh, sorry, uh, yep, yeah, stage one and stage two APTC uh, graduates. As we pointed out in the presentation, uh, the stage one has much more of a profile based on traditional trade qualifications. Stage two moved right away from that and went for uh, service occupations and occupations, particularly in uh, social welfare, such as youth workers and disability studies, etc. So, um, but the fact that somebody has a certificate three doesn't mean that they're eligible for TSS. It, it, it depends on whether they've got uh, basically a trade uh, qualification. So that's the best indicator of whether they've got um, the prospect of a TSS uh, qualification relevant, uh, a relevant qualification for TSS. But you can actually look up the, the list of occupations that are uh, applicable under TSS. Uh, well, there's a question. Should we keep, keep going, Sadna? Or? Um, let's keep going a few more minutes. Uh, if there is a question, yes. Um, Stephen, do you want to answer Elizabeth Jackson's question? Yeah, maybe I'll just put up this slide again. Um, um, yeah. The question is, what, the, what are the explanations for the employment outcomes of job seekers, did you consider particularly of domestic markets? To what extent would broad employment and economic trends in the different countries have impacted on outcomes? Yeah, so I'll just share this slide, which I hope you can see, which shows it by country, because that the question is about those domestic markets. Um, yeah, it is, it is surprising uh, that even some of the bigger markets, like say PNG, um, like Kiribati is a small market, right? You might think it's going to be saturated pretty quickly. So it would fall from 71% to 54, but then PNG, right? 75% to 49. Um, so it's, you know, it's across the board, right? I mean, maybe it's a bit less in uh, Fiji, but, you know, even the no paid work in Fiji goes from 18 to 32. Uh, so I mean, it's, it's really dramatic in PNG, but it is pretty much across the board. So I think we have not been able to come up with sort of a country specific uh, explanation uh, for these findings, I'm afraid. All right, I'll, I'll answer the one from Jonathan Granger. Has consideration been given to uh, training visa subclass uh, 407 that 
it is uh, an interesting suggestion and it, and it suggests, uh, as we said, uh, other policy options, uh, including giving opportunities for APTC graduates to receive training in Australia after they've uh, qualified. So uh, that's good to have a concrete uh, suggestion made about that. Okay, do we see any more questions? I'm losing track of those, but it looks like we're, uh, that's all we have time for. Richard, um, Stephen, any last words before we wrap this up? Uh, well, I just say again, thank everyone. And, um, you know, I, it, it's never easy when you release something critical, but uh, really appreciate everyone's engagement. and. And just want to re-emphasize this is a really big uh, expense and utilization of the aid budget uh, and ultimately taxpayers funding so these kind of questions are sort of important and and really kind of uh, central to our mission i guess at the development policy center where we have a strong focus on aid effectiveness and also on on labor mobility so yeah we appreciate the chance to do this work uh, it's great to have the data on which you can do the analysis. Uh, we hope we've been able to add some value and uh, definitely we want to continue in this area. So please do uh, get in touch if you're interested and, and do send us your, your comments and thoughts. Yeah, and I'd just like to thank Nick Crosling. I noticed he's just loved a comment thanking us. We're, we're certainly happy to continue discussion about how the APTC's labour mobility objective can be more completely implemented. The, 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 the brief that we policy brief we put together is just the start of it. It requires further follow up work to get more on the ground information from people talking to people like uh, Jonathan Granger, who joined conversation today. Thank you. Okay, if some of you want to stay on a bit longer and have a bit of an informal discussion with Richard and Stephen, do so. And we encourage you to pursue the discussion beyond this seminar by getting in touch with Richard and Stephen via email. And of course, uh, with APTC on ways we can maximize um, on the remit it was set up for, while keeping in mind there's going to be adjustments that are needed, um, that are required for unemployment with COVID-19 and the currently closed borders. Um, thank you all for joining us. Look out for future Dev Policy seminars that we hold fortnightly. Go to devpolicy.anu.edu.au for details and register. Vina Kavakalevu and stay safe. Modemanda. Thank you.